Hey everyone, so today we're going to be talking to Annie P. Ruggles, the founder of Non Sleazy Sales Academy. Annie, how are you doing? I am great. How are you? Oh, I'm doing all right. Not too bad. Um, so Annie, why don't you uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Well, as you said, I'm the founder of the Non Sleazy Sales Academy. Now, what that means is that I work with coaches, healers, and what I call do-gooder helper people, including a lot of copywriters who really just want to take the best of them and use that in the service of others, but have a hard time including themselves in that transaction. And what I mean by that is they have an aversion and avoidance or a lack of skill in sales. And that's where I come in. Nice. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your overall sales background? Like why, what it is that, uh, how you got the passion for it and, and why um, they should be like paying attention to the sort of mindset coaching and things that you can, you can actually provide. Uh, you know, it's really interesting because I never, ever, 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 ever expected to teach sales ever mm. in that uh, if you talk about sales aversion, I think the most averse person to it was me. Uh, I hated it. I thought it cheapened my work. I thought it made me look slimy and sleazy. And so I really avoided it for a long time when I myself was a marketing and branding strategist and a copywriter. So I had launched a coaching business uh, a long time ago now, but I ran that. I, I tried to be a life coach for a little bit when I didn't really understand what life coaching was. I was very young. Sure. And uh, I was doing all my own marketing and people started hiring me and I was so excited. But then I saw this trend pretty quickly that people were not hiring me for me to life coach them because mm. I didn't really know what I was doing. They were actually <laughs> hiring me because my coaching business was well marketed and profitable and they wanted to know why. Mm. And so I was like, oh, hold on. Maybe I have natural talent here. I already sure. had been focused on writing. And so it became marketing and branding, largely writing for coaches specifically. But I realized over a decade of doing that, that if I don't take people all the way to the finish line of sales and mm -hmm. shove them across it, they can stay in marketing for ever oh, they yeah. can tell everyone around them all about how wonderful their stuff is and never tell them to buy it mm -hmm. never tell them how to buy it yeah. never tell them how much it costs never tell them anything of actual tangible action orientation and value right because right. we get stuck in marketing and so i looked at myself and i was like sales avoidance has to begin and end with me like, I got to figure this out. So I took a two-year deep dive into all things sales and selling and ethics and morals and integrity and leadership and sales copywriting and conversion and relationship marketing. And uh, that was at the beginning of 2019. And now at recording, this is the beginning of 2021. Awesome. That's awesome. So I guess what I'm hearing is that what you're saying is that marketing is not sales. And I think that's something that um, people innately don't quite understand or get. They think like, if I just create enough content, right? And I think that's part of that is um, because of just how the marketing world is, right? Everyone wants their own spin. And so you have people, um, not saying that he never gives good advice or anything. I'm just giving a random example here, but you have people like uh, like a Gary V that's just like, you yeah. know, get on the content hamster wheel and yeah. put out 700 pieces a day. And yep. eventually you'll make, get a million followers and you'll be rich and famous. And there and you go. And then you repurpose those 700 sure. pieces of content into 9 billion pieces of content. <laughs> and then you have to segment those 9 billion pieces right. of content into 87 email lists. And then eventually you become an overnight sensation. Like, yes, yeah. of course. Sure. I love Gary V. I love the people that I call the church of Gary V. They're <laughs> all great. But right. the thing is, he's totally right about the hamster wheel in that marketing is shiny and marketing is, uh, you know, a lot of times it's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. It gets you some recognition. It gets you that dopamine hit of likes and shares and sure. tweets and mentions right. and blah, blah. But it doesn't actually get you into the end zone. It doesn't actually mm. get a score. Right. It's basically like getting all the way to the end zone and then being like, game over. 
No, yeah. it's not over. You're right there. Like, yeah, yeah. if that happened in the Super Bowl, we would break our TV with baseball bats. <laughs> like, don't do that to yourself. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's like getting, having an amazing date and then at the very end being like shaking hands, like not even like trying to go in for a not hug or a kid. you're just like, all right, bye-bye and just like walk away and you're just like, Julio, what happened? That is the perfect, perfect, perfect analogy. Perfect. The one I use, like, I love that. Like, don't even try. Don't even try. Like, it's the best date you've ever mm. had in your life. And at the end of it, you're like, see ya. Right. You know, like, if you intentionally, not even like, don't even try, if you're if you try the opposite, if you're like, mm. now let me get away from this person as fast as I possibly can. <laughs> I tell everybody it's like making a chocolate cake and mm. it's a family recipe for chocolate cake and it's your grandma's recipe and you find this perfect picture of her making it. You tell everybody the story about it. You source the ingredients. You go to the grocery store. You go to three grocery stores in a pandemic to get specialty ingredients, right? right. You make this cake 50 times so you can make it look perfect. You practice it. You do everything you get a big thing together you run facebook ads you do seo you're telling everybody that they're going to come and be able to be in the same space as this cake that you have been talking about for months and then they come and you're piping cake smell through the vents and the cake comes out and it's in a locked glass box mm. you can smell it right you can see it yeah you can't touch it you can't <laughs> take it you can't yeah. eat it so right. what, but you're standing there salivating because they've whipped you into a beautiful marketing frenzy. Mm -hmm. But are then saying, oh, but actually this is not accessible. Or right. if we have the box, we take our beautiful cake out and we're just like, you know, this cake that we've been hyping for all of these, you know, weeks, months, years, some of us. Mm -hmm. and And then we, you know, approach the buyer, the audience that's gathered for the cake, and we're like, you know, I understand if you don't want to pay for the cake, though. Right. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. It's it it can start. Yeah. It, it doesn't really it innately to you know maybe to you and I who have been doing this for some time. It seems like it doesn't quite make sense, but I do remember, uh, and I've trained so many people, um, literally hundreds of people throughout my my years, and so like I know that. Some people, it, they have no problem, right? It's, but the others just really do have a, a sort of aversion to it and they're, they're shy and they don't want to and they just like, they're great. Normally those people are amazing at building relationships like you just yep. said. But when it comes to the actual, like, do you want to purchase this? They dance around it so much that eventually the customer ends up purchasing from someone else. Well, um, that's exactly why you said that magical word relationship. Mm -hmm. And because... Okay, so one of the things you see in sales book after sales book after sales book after sales book after sales book is that empathy is critically important in sales. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of the relationship aspect, because of garnering, building, and keeping trust, right? right? Of course, absolutely. But if you look at naturally empathic people, the people it comes to naturally, they are among the most sales avoidant people because they're worried about tarnishing that relationship that they've gathered or abuse used it in some way, right? They sure. don't want to hurt the nature of their relationship. So like you just said, people that are naturally gifted toward relationship-based marketing and storytelling-based marketing, then really do not like the idea of having to switch and say, and the price for this is this. Right. Does that work? If so, click here. And the thing is, it's because it's not those people's fault. We mm. have been taught as a culture and as a world for generations that selling is sleazy, that right. selling is cheap and nasty and manipulative and everybody's out to make a buck and doesn't care about you. And guess what? That's because a lot of people sell that way. That's sure. true. Yep. But just because a lot of people sell that way, it doesn't mean that you have to sell that way. Mm -hmm. if you intentionally learn to sell in a different way, right? right? And so what I wanna say to all those relationship marketers is don't stab the relationship in the face trying not to offend someone. Right. You're actually committing a bigger, graver sin on that person by denying them the value you've been promising all along. Yeah, no, 100%, I agree. I think um, a couple things come to mind first. I always say that too. I, I always tell the people I train, I'm like, do you honestly believe that you have a good product um, or that we sell good products here? 
And they go, well, yeah, man, it's, you know, it's top end, it's great, it's quality, blah, blah, blah. I own it, I bought it, you know, whatever. Um, and it's like, okay, so why wouldn't you allow somebody to do that? Because you know what's going to happen is, um, as I just said before, like they're, they're, they're going to dance around and then they're going to walk away and they're going to go to Joe down the street. Is Joe a good guy? Well, no, I don't think Joe's a good guy. He's a, he's a scam artist, whatever. Like he has, he's always has customer issues. And you're like, so why are you letting them go to Joe? If you know yes. what you sell is top quality, source amazingly well, et cetera. You are driving them into the arms of Joe. And what's right. wild is that a lot of us went into business in the first place to be the anti-Joe. Right. Yeah. We can't be the anti-Joe if we don't compete with Joe. Mm -hmm. And the best part is competing with Joe is easy because Joe sucks. <laughs> so as long as right. we wear our integrity, our values, our customer focus, our relationship focus, our empathy, our uh, dedication to product, our dedication to quality, mm -hmm. our transparency, whatever your values are, as long as you make sure that those are just so loud in your brand that they speak their own copy, right. then you're fine. You're great. But at the end of that, though, you have to say, look, your purchase is important mm -hmm. to me. Your trust is important to me. I hope I've shown you that we deserve your business and are looking forward to earning it time and time again. If you don't take that last step, then they're going to go, well, I guess they don't want to work with me. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe sure. I'm not ready for this. Maybe right. we send them subconsciously on their own, you know, downward spiral. Right. Then they go over to Joe and Joe goes, hey, you slob. Heard so-and-so <laughs> didn't want to work with you. What's yeah. that about? Or you you must suck. It's okay. You're not going to suck anymore because I'm here and you're going to pay me three times what you would have paid them because I'm the best. Right. Yeah. What? You're hundred percent right. You are, you are. I think the one, one of the worst experiences I had with a Joe, I won't mention his name. Um, but, uh, at this time I was, I was young. I was probably in my, uh, I don't know. I think I just graduated. So I was probably, I was probably like 18 ish, you know? Um, and I was doing the whole like door to door salesman sort of thing. And, uh, Oh, you poor darling. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, yeah, exactly. Right. But that was my first ex real experience in, in regards to sales, like completely on my own. My family's had owned multiple businesses, like car lots and things like that before. And I've kind of like yeah. helped ish by like navigating like general customer stuff, like, hey guys and whatnot, um, but not like actual trying to make money for myself. And so I'm doing this and I'm like, you know, I'm making sales here and there, but it's nothing spectacular. But then like, there's this one guy that just seems to always be killing it. And I'm like, and I listened to him talking to the uh, manager in this location and they're just bragging and the guy's just like, man, it's awesome because like I got this woman who's uh, has four kids, is single and on welfare to buy this new blank. And he's like, and she's not going to be able to afford this thing, but I just made my commission and I just made the company a ton of money. And the manager was just like, that's freaking awesome. I can't yeah, believe that big old idiot bought it. Like, Yes, yeah. scam and that I'm... single welfare mom. <laughs> Get her. Right. right. Like that's why the reputation exists. Exactly. It is real. There mm -hmm. are people that do not care that are making money over and over and over and over and over by not caring. Right. But that doesn't mean that in order to sell, you have to cease to care. Absolutely. Yeah. If you just heard that story, if you're listening and you're just like, oh my God, I would never ever do that. I would never right. sell anybody 100%. more than they need. Great good for you. You sure. should be making money too. Mm -hmm. You can, right? Yeah. For me, the moment in that, in, in my earlier phases of business, when I was in my like, you know, paying my dues job, sure. Um, I was working for another coach and I was representing her with her clients mm -hmm. and it was a very high ticket program. And I had an intro call with someone and I'm not on their sales team. I'm not teaching them sales. I'm completely sand, like no right. touch to sales at all. Yeah. And I have a call with this woman and she's whispering <clears throat> and I'm like, are you all right? Does your throat hurt? Like, are you yeah. okay? And she's like, no, I'm fine. I was like, okay, well, is now a bad time? Like, do you have a baby sleeping? Like I was trying to figure out. Sure. Right, right, right. Yeah. She was hiding in the closet because her husband told her she couldn't spend the money. Oh, and wow. the sales team encouraged her not to tell him. Mm. So she was siphoning money from her kid's college fund. Oh, my God. 
to take wow. a program that she was not ready for. Right. And by the and she took it under duress the whole time because yeah. she had to take the whole thing in a closet hiding from her oh. husband. And guess what happened? Halfway through, he found out. And guess what happened? It was too late for her to get a refund. So now she's right. got a program that's way too much for her. She's got all this stress. She's stealing money from her children. She's lying mm -hmm. to her husband. And her husband finds out and says, you got to drop out. That causes this big problem. Of course. She never sure. should have been there in the first place. Wow. You never should have sold a luxury car to a welfare mom. Like, sure. that is not the only way. But we can meet people where we are. If you mm -hmm. went onto that car lot and you said, hey, Times are really tough for you right now. You need a really safe car. You have little kids. Let me right. look at what we have that's closer to your price point. It may be a little bit outside if it needs yeah. to be for safety reasons, but we'll get you better financing or mm -hmm. something. Right. There's always a way to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. Where What sleazy selling does, though, is it says, I'm going to sell that person whatever I want that person to buy for me. Right. Yeah. You know, as a trainer, I want to redefine a salesperson. You know, like I, I hate that, that idea. Cause it, it does, it makes it to where you like almost don't feel confident even bringing it up uh, like at parties or events to be like, Oh yeah, I'm a salesman. It's like people automatically, again, like you were saying, you know, they just say, this guy's a sleaze ball. He's going to, you know, whatever. And, it, and I'm like, man, I, I really want to redefine what that means because to me, and maybe this is just my opinion. Um, but to me, I'd rather sleep well at night than close that one extra sale and make an extra 50 bucks or whatever. Like I just, yeah. I, I can't, for me, I can't do it. And so for me, I think if you can't sell ethically, you're not a salesman, right? Yeah. And, and this is my opinion. Like, I don't think you are. I don't, I think if you are a POS, you are not a salesman because anybody, it's sort of almost like uh, there was a, one of my trainers or coaches used to tell me, um, if you absolutely have to, uh, give a discount as your very first line of defense. And that's like the first thing you say to people is like, Hey, welcome into our store, by the way, whatever you need, just let me know. And I can give you 50% off that you aren't a salesman. You're, you're an order taker. You're just there yeah. to hand out coupons. Yeah. And so I kind of feel the same way in that regard with like, if you were just there to steal people's money and, and manipulate it and things like that, like you're not a salesperson because no. how difficult is it to be unethical and to lie and to cheat and to steal? Like, it's not all that difficult. It's, it's no, more it's difficult, easy. right? It's, it's more difficult to thing in the world. Anybody can make a horrible sale one time, right? But here's the thing. You're going to make that horrible sale one time. Sure. How I tell people like, well, how do I know if I'm selling sleazily and i mm -hmm. say do you get repeat customers great do way you get sure. testimonials do you get referrals all of those things mean that your customer saw the value in you mm -hmm. and wants to reinvest in the relationship right sure. if you're getting repeat business if you're getting the lifetime value of the customer not just the one-time transaction then you're not selling sleazily and if you're getting that without attempting to sell at all then your business is on the verge of blowing the heck up sure if you actually started selling you would be freaking killing it <laughs> just by adding that last step mm -hmm. onto what you're already doing yeah and i think to add to that is like if you can also wake up in the morning and not have to worry about putting out customer service fires every day all day long because that's the other thing, right? Whenever, oh. whenever you sell unethically, you are dealing with constant issues. And it's just like yeah. after one after the other, after the other, after the other. And it's always about, nope, sorry, can't give you back your money for that or that. Or, and this just becomes this reputational problem. Um, whereas when you sell ethically, you, I mean, everyone always has some sort of customer service issue because a lot of it's out of your control in terms of like this product broke or something in transit. Fine. But like, that's all you got to deal with. You don't have to deal with Google reviews saying this person's a complete scammer, et cetera, no. et cetera, et cetera. No. And, right. and you know, you don't have to deal with, we think it's going to tarnish your reputation. Mm -hmm. Heck no. If yeah. you tarnish your reputation, it's because you're intentionally doing something wrong. Yeah. Right. If people are 
coming at you, not haters, not internet trolls, sure. not your competitors designed as haters and trolls, but if you're really, really making people upset, then you're doing something incompletely or just dead wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But if you put yourself out there in a positive way, they're not going to remember you for the transaction. They're going to remember you for what they came to you for in, for in the first place, which is the value you provide. Right. Yeah. So if you make a big friggin' deal about the transaction, right? If you make mm -hmm. it all about getting the money, then, okay, that's a one-time transaction. But sure. if you say, okay, now that I've told you what I want, I'm going to offer you this thing. Do you want it? Cool. You take it. Awesome. Give me money. Money received. Thank sure. you. Product delivered. And then value trots out. Yeah. If I'm more focused on the value trotting out, then I'm going to have less customer service issues. But mm -hmm. that's why I feel like all salespeople should have to work in customer service. Yeah. Everyone should be required to sit in a phone bank where people call and scream at them. Right. Not because they deserve it. Yeah. But... It taught me so much about how to use my communication skills, my empathy, my personality, the things that come to me naturally, mm -hmm. how to use those things to handle those situations. And now I just do that up front in the form of objection handling right. and looking at the services I provide and making sure I'm not but I'm not building any landmines of customer mm -hmm. service nightmares into my business. Exactly. So I want to go over some of the questions that uh, uh, some of the people in our audience uh, had previously asked. I thought yeah. it would be great to talk to you about. Um, but right before I do that, there was one story that I thought was really funny because you mentioned haters. And the other day I was going scrolling through Instagram and I saw this ad, I think it was for like a texting company. Um, I don't remember what the name was, but it was like, you know, like build your text community, etc. So I clicked on it because I saw some of the comments and I um, was like just kind of scrolling through to see what people were saying or whatever. And one of the top comments, <clears throat> excuse me, was this guy saying, you know, how stupid is this ad? How stupid is this company? Just like really just like getting into them. And I was just like, dang, this guy, right? And so what I did, I don't know why I did it, but I did, uh, I hit his profile. Of course so you then did. It, and so then it takes it to the profile and then it says founder of, and it has like the name, right? So I was like, I wonder what that is. I click it and it's a text-based app. He was yeah. just hating on his competition, but he, that was, and I just thought that was hilarious. So like, I have to like, wow. So you know, sometimes your haters are just that? your competition. Exactly. But here's the thing that's even worse about that. Yeah. For that dude, where you're like, I don't even know why I did it, but I clicked the guy's profile. Every single person right. that saw that jerk's comment is gonna go, who's this jerk? And right. they're gonna go down the same rabbit hole that you did. And they're gonna be like, wait, what's this? Oh, he's a competitor. And now mm -hmm. he looks like a butthead. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, I was like, I'll never buy from like that company troll, for sure. Right, before he just looked like a random anonymous internet troll. Yeah. But then you go over and you're like, oh, well, no. That person's a butthead because there are <laughs> ways that you can stand against your competitors mm -hmm. in powerful, non-confrontational, but charged ways. There are ways right. to do that, yeah. right? But that ain't it. <laughs> yeah, 100%. That ain't it. 100%. Um, okay, so let's get, yeah, so now that I told my story, let's go into the uh, kind of the mindset of selling. You know, I think we talked about it a little bit here, mm -hmm. but just to get maybe into a little bit, something a little bit more specific is, um, yeah. I guess it was really broken down into two questions. The first being, is selling itself spammy and sleazy and all that? And nope. won't people hate me for trying to email them or sell to them uh, online? Not if you do it with permission. Okay. Well, yeah. What so, about that? So the great thing is writing is a beautiful way to garner permission through copy. Mm -hmm. And you see this in well-constructed stuff or even the format of things like sales pages where we're guiding people section by section, almost in a coaching capacity, right? We're leading them. Some could say manipulating them, but that's a long, long story that I won't get into. I have a whole right. other video about that, but no. They're leading them through the process of making a decision. So the first thing is we got to redefine sales mm -hmm. as this and only this. Sales is saying, this is the price. Here is the button. Please click it. Right. 
That's it. Yeah. That's all sales is. There's no emotion in that part at all. It's a number and a button and a please. That's mm-hmm. it. It's not a manipulation. It's not this big thing. If anything, marketing's more manipulative than sales. Again, sure. we won't get into it. But right, right. if we if we redefine selling as just the cherry on the top of the sundae that gets that transaction done, mm-hmm. there's nothing inherently bad about that. Right. Now, are your friends and family going to hate you or people in your network going to hate you if you sell to them? Yes, if you sell to them like a jerk. Sure, yeah. If you pester the ever-loving daylights out of them. Yeah. If you do like what a lot of multi-level marketing people do and send messages to people you haven't seen since high school that's like, sure. hey, babe, how's your fam? And you're like, I don't know you. And then they're like, <laughs> here's some nail polish you should buy. Then I'm going to be right. like, you black, go away. But sure. the thing is... Again, it's not your fault if you feel that way because we've all been sold too badly or attempted mm-hmm. to be sold too badly, right? Right. But if you are asking your friends and family for support genuinely, let that be a genuine ask without the sale. Right. Hey, I want everyone to know what I'm doing and be as specific as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. That's great, okay? But when you're actually sitting down to sell to people Mm -hmm. if you've gotten them to the appropriate point you have already explained to them you understand the problem that they have now this is whether you have them face to face whether you have them in a phone call or whether they're just on a website this is if they're on you know an etsy site or amazon or a website too Mm -hmm. it's all the same right but if You've gotten them to the point where you've addressed that you understand the need of the problem, the emotion of the problem, the quality standards of the (laughs) expectations, the timeline. If you've outlined all of those things and you've positioned yourself fully, right, Mm -hmm. then by the time if they're still reading, they're ready to be sold to. Right. Yeah. Right. So if you wait until the appropriate point, will you annoy them? No. If anything, you'll annoy and alienate them more if you're like, will you stop shouting at me about your products all the time? (laughs) I want to help you, but give me a buy button. Right. Sure. Yeah. A hundred percent. You got to, you got to have the confidence to be able to, to sell and know that you're doing good and not, um, and you're not just spamming people, even, even using your conversational um, structure, you know, because we teach that uh, even in our programs about how to establish like a chat flow when you're actually going to be talking to either collaborators or um, other clients or customers. And it's like the, mm-hmm. er, everyone's initial instinct is, ooh, that's, isn't that spammy? Because I get Instagram messages like that. I'm like, it's not because what I'm, I'm not telling you to say, hi, how are you? Buy my stuff. Because that is no, spammy. That, that is, is terrible. Super Don't do spammy. that. Right. A like, tale but if of you... two DMs, right? This happens all the time, like what you were just talking about, mm-hmm. right? So the one DM that I could send you, totally cold traffic, we've never met. I start following you, you start following me. That's the extent of our knowledge of each other. Sure. Hey, Julio, thanks for the follow. Here's my masterclass. Right. Is there anything inherently wrong with that? Well, no. <clears throat> but would it not be infinitely more effective if I say, hey, Julio, thanks for following me? Are you sales avoidant or do you struggle with sales avoidance? Or Mm -hmm. I looked at your profile, see that you teach copywriting. Are you wondering if maybe we could collaborate? And then you could come back to me and you could say, you know what? I have a podcast. And I was thinking maybe you'd be a good guest. And then I could be like, you know what? My master class is a really good example of me talking. Here's the link. I got there, but I took the extra time to make sure I was answering the correct yeah. question and setting myself in the correct lane instead of just yeah. assuming right. that you're going to want my one size fits all. Exactly. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's about building that relationship and it doesn't have to be over the course of 150 messages, you know, but it, it no! does need to be something besides just, hi, here's my stuff. Right. It's Goldilocks, right? Like right. 150 messages is way too long. Two messages is way too short. Right. You got to, exactly. You got to build some sort of connection. And, and I think a good example of that is just how even we connected, right? Like you uh, uh, mess- gave me a message, and but your thing was well thought out. And it had something to do with my actual podcast. Like, hey, I enjoyed this episode. And like, even if, even if, and I'm not saying it was, but even if, because it's totally okay. Even if 90% of it was some form of copy and paste and you filled out, 
you know, blanks here, here, enter name here, enter name here, whatever. That's totally fine because at least I know that you went to my profile. Mm -hmm. You did look at something. You did mm -hmm. click something and uh, listen to five minutes of my old podcast and said, hey, this was a great episode or whatever. That's okay because what happened is now it allowed me to, to say, let me talk to Annie, let me reply back and let's get on a conversation versus the 20 other messages that didn't even talk about my podcast or anything. They literally just said, hi, I'm, you know, blank, Cheryl, hey, Joe, I'm whatever. Here. Here's, yeah, here's my stuff. I would like to be on a call tomorrow. And it's just like, I don't even know you. I don't know what you, you don't know my audience. You don't know anything about me. Like, like when I'm I not get stuff call. for my show and they're like, hey, Andrew. And you're like, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Like, what? Right. what? what? Yeah. Even the most no. basic thing. Sure. I mean, that's, that's entirely true because listen, I do because of how busy I am. Of course. A lot of my stuff is not necessarily templated, but it comes out because I've written those emails a thousand times. Right. But the thing is, in my head, those emails are templates. They have mm -hmm. Mad Lib gaps in them, right? right? So when I pitch to you, I say in my head, dear name, insert name. Sure. Julio. Right. I would love to pitch to you to be a guest on. Right. Copy ID. Because giant gap. Right? Yeah. Like those gaps are the most critical thing. And so mm -hmm. at any point of selling in any avenue, if you're worried about how you're coming across, take the chance to personalize what you're talking about. Tie it back to their language. Tie it back to their stuff. If you've had conversations with them, use things they've said. Right. If they, if you haven't had a conversation with them, if it's on a website, read your reviews. If you're selling physical products and somebody says this bracelet makes me feel like an empress. Right. Bracelets for empresses. Play with that. See how sure. you feel. Yeah. Right. But but make it as personal feeling as you can person by person, because the most important thing that you can do in great copy and in beautiful selling conversations is make your audience feel seen. That's it. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's why. I mean, uh, that's why Anima Marketing says like you can add like hey first name things like that because it's been proven time and time again that adding just some sort of element that you're talking to them at least helps to increase that chance of open or helps to increase that chance of click. You know, by 20, 30, 40 percent. So like if you're not and you're just spamming everybody as far as like extremely general messages and never mentioning who they are, what they do, what their particular pain point might be you're always going to, it, it, you're be, it becomes a, a solely reliant on the numbers game. And you have to, and now I have to send out 10,000 messages in order for me to get any sort of sales because yes. you're just not doing it. You know what I mean? Because you're sending out 10,000 messages of noise. Right. Yep, exactly. Um, so I guess to, to get kind of past the mindset and into the more like how to's, I, this was a question that came up and it was how to actually, and we kind of touched on it here, but I want to see if there's anything additional you want to add to it, which was mm -hmm. like how to actually sell online. And what I mean by that is like a lot of people and you know, uh, we, I, we sort of mentioned this earlier uh, when we were talking off air, but I'll mention it again. There are three things that people always say that they're good at and that's fighting sex and sales. And I, I, when it comes to sales, it is always um, interesting to hear people go, I am amazing at sales. And you go, great. <laughs> and then you say, what, you know, you allow them to, especially when I was training people, I'd say, okay, cool. Let's see what you can do. And when it comes to it, it there, it's just not that right. But they just innately think because I can have a conversation with people and I've had friends and family buy my stuff before, I must be a sales king or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to people who are used to selling online or I mean, face-to-face, -face, like as far as yeah. trade shows and trunk shows and craft shows and all that sort of stuff, um, conventions and whatnot, when they're transitioning to the more e-com space and trying to sell, yeah. you know, especially like custom order pieces, either through zoom or through phone calls, like, I think, um, I, I'll just run it to you. How, how can they effectively, do that like how do they bring that element of face-to-face -to, -face mm -hmm. to a more non-personal thing like a phone call so video is your friend mm -hmm. 
Video is your friend. It is the next best thing to being available. Now, in addition to taking like long form video like this, there are also a lot of really cool sites like Bonjoro, which is spelled B-O-N-J-O-R-O, -O, uh, which just sends little quick video messages. Those of you sending physical products, what if you were including those with your tracking updates, right? Mm -hmm. What if you're saying like, oh, your product's in the way, it looks like it's in Indiana, right? right? You're building that excitement as much as, maybe not as much as, hey, I'm handing you this thing that I've been painstakingly making, but mm -hmm. you can still build joy and enthusiasm and do better storytelling right. on video. So make sure you're pitching your stuff on video, either to everyone or you're incorporating video in your transactions before, during, after, play with it, see where it feels right. right. The other is make sure you're bringing up both the emotion and the value of whatever you're selling simultaneously. Some people really need to understand the method, right? The roadmap of what you're giving them. They need to know the ins, the outs, the A's, the B's, the C's, the how it gets made, yeah. right? Other people don't care about that, but they want to know every single possible ingredient and how you chose it. And yeah. what you didn't include and why right? right that's more for physical product but they really want to know those specific things some sure. people just want to know who they're giving their money to right they just want to know the face behind the brand the story behind the thing right they mm -hmm. they want to know the grandma behind the cake to go right. back to my first example sure. right and other people are like i can't spend money on me so if i'm gonna buy this you gotta tell me how it's gonna fit, benefit everybody today tomorrow and next thursday right. right so if you're looking at all four of those buyer types if you're making sure that you're talking about quality and story if mm -hmm. you're talking about ethics and the roadmap if you're right. making sure you're peppering in different details you'll reach different people yeah. and then whenever ever possible elicit emotion through beautiful copy and get yourself on video that's great i couldn't agree more i think it's a, it's impaired video is imperative and if audio is something that you absolutely have to do because people you know, some people may just refuse to be on video or whatever even if your face is the only one shown like on a zoom call that at least allows them to help build that trust and that know and that like to you, even if you can't necessarily read them. Um, and if for some crazy reason it happens to, that you only can do this, um, maybe there's a to poor internet connection or whatever that you have to do it um, you know, over the phone. Either way, like you said, uh, making sure that you're touching base on both the logical and the emotional and trying to connect with them and their particular pain points and not just rambling forever, but you know, it's an old sales thing where they say you have two ears and one mouth, so you should listen twice as much as you speak, you know, like listen to if, them. If you got nothing else from this, listen twice as much as you speak. There you go. That alone <laughs> will separate all of it. I my that's so much more beautiful than my version of that. The way that I normally teach that is I say your only job on a sales call is to shut up. <laughs> well, I like yours better because it just, it, okay. Like, yeah, it, I like the sweet one. I like the rough <laughs> one. It's fine. But yeah, it is. If you're finding yourself talking more than you're listening, mm -hmm. you're missing opportunities. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, and then like the final question was really a matter of, um, not so much should I sell, but how often should I sell? And uh, before I give my two cents on that, I would love to hear what you think about that. So how the person asked, how often should I sell to my followers or to my list? My favorite ratio is four to one. Mm. Some people say three to one. Some people say five to two. My favorite ratio is four to one, meaning uh, now some people for physical product people, it really is more of like a three and then two and then three and then two because it's a lot easier to convince someone the quality of this beautiful vase and the story behind it than it is to say like, sign up for 17 months of coaching. Right, right? Like, sure. But value, objection handling, value, storytelling, mm -hmm. sale. Right, yeah. That's, that's my ratio. Um, so, what I always like to say is it depends on like, if you, should you do a hard sell, like buy my stuff today? Should you do that every day? No. Should you do it every once in a while? Yeah. To help get that, you know, across the finish line. Um, although I don't necessarily have a, uh, a ratio in mind, 
what I like to do is structure my stuff um, as a general kind of almost a content calendar sort of way. Yeah. Um, I like to do it as a basically a hard sell. Then I go soft sell, which is essentially like asking. It's a, it's a permission based selling technique. It's mm -hmm. I'm going to teach you this. Is that OK with you? And if so, click here to learn more about that and blah, 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 blah. Then you have like value base, which is like you were saying, like it's about giving instruction or letting people know how you make things and how you're sourcing it and things like that. But in the end, you're still sort of selling because they're interested in the product that you're creating you're and they can learn them more. You're selling action before right. you're selling them a product or service, right? Exactly. You're selling them, click here, sign up here, get on this mailing list, watch this video, learn more. Yeah. You're selling them that action yeah. before you're selling them the rest. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I saw a video um, really recently from a gentleman by the name of Taki Moore, somebody that I follow quite a bit as far as uh, he's like a coach. And um, he was talking up sort of about this. And he was saying, you know, the problem is that we always go, um, we always do a, like a one-to-one -one ratio. We create content and then we try to sell that content, but then the, we try to do, we just keep doing that. And he goes, what you should be doing is creating content and then figuring out five, you know, the other five days of the week should be in some form or capacity trying to sell that content and a lot of, and his belief is largely on soft selling. So it's just permission based. It's just like, I'm going to keep giving you value. It's just at the very end of the value. I'm going to say, click here. If you want to learn a little bit more, click here to get a better sense of this or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's not buy my stuff today, or you're going to regret it for the rest of your life, which is not the way you should phrase that. Or, you know what I mean? No. So that's, that's sort of my idea is like, you should sell much more consistently than you think, but it needs to be soft selling. Um, and rarely, if ever, should you do the hard sell. And if you do the hard sell, don't do it as a, um, don't be a jerk about it, essentially. It's incremental. It's like football. It's in downs. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you get all the way down there. Good for you. Sometimes right. you just bang mm -hmm. straight in, no yeah. resistance. Good for you when that happens. But most of the time it's bring them a little bit further with mm -hmm. you, fall down, wait, bring them a little bit further with you, fall down, wait. Even sure. if you don't fall, there's it's chunky. It's a right. chunkier process. Yeah. So if your sales process feels chunky, you're not doing anything wrong, you're in the thick of it, keep going toward the goal. Exactly. Now, Annie, um, I know, you know, we got to wrap up, but I wanted to let people know because I think that's a great way to actually segue into it is just like how they can know more about you. Um, can you tell them a little bit about your your podcast and the actual academy and how you teach and things like that? Heck yeah. So my program is called Sales for Empaths. It's specifically for coaches, healers, helpers, do-gooders, copywriters, people who are trying to use the best of them to serve others. But before you even consider hiring me, go take my free masterclass, mm. Making Selling Easy Without Getting Sleazy. And you can find that anytime, 24-7, 365, at Annie P ruggles.com slash easy not sleazy or that is mentioned at the last chunk of every episode of my podcast too legitimate to quit we have a lot of fun on that show it's small business uh advice and strategy with a pop culture spin and i would love it if you would give it a listen Awesome. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate your time. Everyone, please check her out. Give her a follow. Go check out that masterclass. I'll also add a uh, link to the show notes. So if you need to go into the podcast itself and just click over, that's totally cool. Um, well, Annie, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry that we're kind of cutting off uh, a little bit abruptly, here. but um, I got a skedaddle. Um, but thank you again for sharing this information. I'm, I would love to have you on again. And I think this was really helpful for a lot of people. Um, Okay. Well, everyone, I'll talk to y'all later. Have an amazing day and uh, we're out. Thank Have you. A good one. Bye.